good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks to Brian for inviting me and to Trap. Thanks to Ruth Noack for her enriching presentation and for all the other talks. And I'm sure there will be more during the afternoon. I apologize in advance because my presentation might last more than 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, but I ask you to bear with it because uh, hopefully there will some, be some thoughts coming out of it which we can discuss later on. Um, in my short address, I'll try to make a few points regarding the Venice Biennale, an event with which I have been working with for at least the, at the past 10 years in a different capacity, and with Norway alone uh, and OCA for the past five years. I had the pleasure, for instance, of meeting Anawana Aloba um, there in a talk we organized with OCA in 2009 with John Jonas, uh, the American artist. And it's not because of my personal engagement, though, that I decided to speak about the Venice Biennale in this context, but because, as I'll address further during the course of my presentation, the Venice Biennale seems particular, particularly relevant uh, in such a context as the international events par excellence. It's probably the only art event in the world that it's still based on national representation, and therefore can truly say uh, that it aims to be international uh, from an historical perspective while retaining the modernist concern of building a space of negotiation be between specific nations. Rather than commenting on the world at large, I want to talk about the formation of the idea of international as a world with wider political reverberations, specific effects and effects. The history of the Venice Biennale is an important reference point when thinking about how the dynamics of the world were construed in the European landscape of the 18th and 19th century with sovereign countries, their supposed independence, interdependence, hierarchies, alliances, dominances, betrayals, and conspiracies, the taking shape of certain formation of a new Western concept of citizenship, migration, borders, cultural elites, their movements across territory and communities, markets, tourism, education, all matters that directly and indirectly started with terms such as internationalism, which this seminar aims to address. In the case of the Venice Biennale, internationalism points backward towards London's great exhibition of industry of all nations in 1851. It's important to give, to give its name in full, the first international world fair, which set the standard for, for Britain's industrial production and design in both an artistic and a scientific sense. Visited by over six million people, the exhibition was integral to popularizing of spectac spectacular large events uh, for, uh, for large crowds and in setting the pace for greater modernity to enter every aspect of human life, from the texture of the cityscape through the proto-functional architecture of the Crystal Palace to a new abstraction in interiors by proposing a, 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 a harmony of colors and the, tec and the technology of patterns. In the wake of the Industrial Revolution and with the, race, the rise of capitalism, the exhibition publicized itself as a celebration of commercial liberalism and free trade among nations, promoting the British political and societal model, as well as progress through technology, machinery, urbanization, and scientific discovery. By demonstrating the East India Company's exploitation of the wealth of the empire in terms of the raw material that it, it was unable to produce itself, it un unwittingly admitted to Britain's dependence on other lands. I'm looking backward at this exhibition instead of going forward uh, because these events allow one to re-examine the very meaning of internationalism. The arrival of international as a new English word uh, in the vocabulary uh, came in 1789, when Jeremy Bentham used it, used it in the field of law to define how bourgeoisie could move capitals across borders, a mercantile preoccupation. 
I think it's important to retrace these lines connecting Venice back to London and then forward towards the international modernism that passed through Germany and then to New York because such change would not have been possible from within the arts alone. It needs to be considered within a larger ambition of the time, which was to redesign the world according to modernist paradigm that would outline, embrace, and project an image of progress, a concept that was in itself information and in need of dissemination. Then we could ask what kind of space for internationalization does the international exhi art exhibition of the city of Venice open when it replicates the machinery of the world marvel. It was not the first time that Venice had attempted to reinvent itself and attract the attention of the world. The events that took place in Venice at the end of the 19th century, of which the Biennale was to be the most successful, successful of all, were set in place as a, a reminder of the cosmopolitan gaiety for which the city was once famous. At the pinnacle of its prosperity in the mid 15th century, the cosmopolitan character of Venice was pronounced on all of its aspects of life with a large Greek, Armenian, Muslim, Turkish, and black population within the city, with Jewish communities and other groups who were persecuted elsewhere, finding refuge and work there. Over 3,000 merchant ships were trading, and many of them could easily have been converted into warships for military transport, a reserve of up to 100 of them where it was harbored in the arsenal, nowadays one of the main exhibition venues. But when the city lost dominion over the Adriatic Sea, Venice changed tack and began conquering Europe by charm. The city became a playground for, uh, for Europe upper crust. Venetian art was incredibly daring, bringing sensuous color and sly social commentary even to religious subjects. Nunneries in Venice held soirees, reveling those in the casino, and the carnival lasted for up to three months. The illegitimate daughters of Venetian nobles were trained as musicians by the likes of Vivaldi, and Venetian courtesans were widely admired taste tastemakers. By the end of the 16th century, Venice was known across Europe for its irresistibly catchy music and for thousands of registered prostitutes. In order to understand the extent of the worldly, worldly project embarked upon by Venice in, in 1895, it's important to throw light on the context of Italy at the end of the 19th century. Firstly, one has to acknowledge that from its very beginning, the Italian nationalist movement had dreamed about Italy joining the modernist world's powers. In the north, extensive industrialization and the building of a modern infrastructure was well underway by the 1890s. Alpine railways lines connected Italy to French, German, and Austrian rail systems. <coughs> Considerable investment was pouring into business from Germany, Britain, France, and others. Subsequently, the Italian state decided to help initiate heavy industry, such as car, car factories, steel works, and shipbuilding. Secondly, it's important to look at the internal demographics of the country's unification of a few decades before, when the capitals had been centralized from the south to the north, and where investment in international relations mattered more than national investment in infrastructure. Not my words, but the ones since I'm paraphrasing here the philosopher Antonio Gramsci during those years. He contended that this continued and constructed north-south divide within Italy was characterized by a colonial relationship with a racialized dynamic pursued through a displacement of capitals to the north. What interests me here is the attempt to, tra to trace parallels between the nation-building built process in Venice 
and those in the foremost centers of modernity, London, Paris, Berlin, and later New York. And now that very modernizing principle implied the deletion of native identities within a territory that was brought under one sovereign country by military force. As an event unique at this time, not in its international format, but in its focus on fine art, the Venice Biennale was part of a cultural agenda put forth by the city council and by extension by the state to use tourism and culture as part of the economic regeneration and nation building ambitions of Italy. The excuse was the celebration of the silver wedding anniversary of King Umberto and Margherita of Savoy. What's also interesting to note is that although claiming to be embarking on a world enterprise, for more than 50 years, the international world in which Venice was interested was very small at the time, differing very little from Italy's primary alignment of trade and commerce. Were it not for the force of custom, as Jeremy Bentham put it, the term international, as first set into action by the Great Exhibition, would rather refer to international jurisprudence. What the Great Exhibition had already revealed was exactly this delicate interdependence of nations and the need to establish a scale of each nation's importance globally by demonstrating the advancement that could be reached through technology and the capitalist process of production. As a platform for modernist capitalist ideals with the ambition to represent the world at large, the Venice Biennale is still today a battleground of outgrown and dying world powers that have not all found a definite form. Last year, the year 2015, 89 countries participated in the Venice Biennale, an increase from just 59 in 1999. And the popularity of the, Venice, of the Biennale continues to grow. Therefore, the event still seems to represent the besieged fortress of modernist ideals. No example of this could be, be more pertinent than Iraq's media collective intervention, Coronation Park, last year where sculptural elements were spread across the historical space of Giardini, referencing, referencing the site that hosted the coronation of King George V and Queen Mary as Emperor and Empress of India in 1911. In Rack's words, no matter how strong the forces of power seem today, in time they inevitably decline. So Coronation Park is talking about the fear of the inevitability of abdication. Seen in this light, the Giardini pavilions become phantasmagorical monuments to world powers of yesterday, but, but also of tomorrow, a space for destruction and recognition, which is also a space for provocation to think about the possible future. Because of the very investment that such a space holds in terms of local and foreign politics, with state representatives, embassies, and civil servants operating in a fictionalized and miniaturized worldly space, the possibility of performing a political intervention presents itself. Such a gesture was enacted by the Mexican artist Gaston Ramirez Feltrin, when in 2003 he participated as a Biennale artist, even though not authorized or invited. Ramirez Feltrin, born in Tepic, and who had lived for many years in Venice, was one of the invisible workers of the Biennale. He gathered discarded materials and built up a pop structure that he called Favela's Pavil Favela Pavilion, so as to initiate a shanty town in the surrounding of the world's power. In the same year, with stateless nation, Alessandro Petti and Sandy Hilal situated themselves between the national pavilions of the Indo Giardini, presenting enlarged travel documents and passports of Palestinian refugees in order to question social, political, 
and special relations between people, states, and territory beyond the liberal, the liberal notion of citizenship. In 1968, when the situation next threatened guerrilla acts at the Biennale, Lawrence Holloway, one of the first historians to look at the Biennale history and its larger logics, defined the Venice Biennale as objectless, not in the sense that there are no objects, but in the sense that even if the artwork, the object, is present, it is a movable concept within the context of the exposition. He goes so far as to say that independently of the single exhibitions being hosted in each pavilion, the entire machinery becomes a data assembly of information mm -hmm. with a communicative purpose. There is, independently of single artworks being presented in the Biennale, the overall structure is an aesthetic signifier that determines what's acceptable in aesthetic terms and in attributing it a value. Even though the pavilions present a vivid array of national self-images, according to Alloway, the exhibition has a structure and hence a message as much as the art show it shows. This message reinstates aesthetic principles determined by the most powerful countries. Such a disapparition of the object, a ghostly presence, or a present absence, occurred in 2015 when the Syrian collective Abu Nadara asked a simil, seemingly simple question There is, in fact, one of the most important questions of our time. Who has the right to the image? Claiming censorship, they withdrew from the Biennale before it even started instead continuing to produce and independently distribute weekly video clips dispatched from Syrian life in all its use and complexity, that they diffuse via digital means in order to deconstruct a unified, normalized version of how reality is portrayed, presented, and mediated all over the world, even and especially in a territory of war such as Syria. Rax Media Collective, Gaston Ramirez Feltrin, Alessandro Petti, and Sandy Hilal, <coughs> and Abu Nadara are all important recent <coughs> examples of, of gaining a fleck of dust from the vast terrain occupied by the world powers. Its continuous absorption of new nation states that de decade after decade have gained momentum on a global financial scale has allowed Venice as in previous centuries, to reinvent itself as a world marvel. It is for this reason that the Biennale will remain important for the future development, not only of the arts, but for showcasing the dynamics of the world and its inequalities. It is therefore fitting to conclude with this quote from Gita Kapoor's Global Vision of 1994. Here, is a strength and a problem, the need to negotiate with powerful cultural elites, and the inevitability of measuring success in terms of the positioning gained in the control of culture and the media that attends to it. If the aim is to turn the center periphery model inside out, then the position may, may change, but not the model we should continue to question the radical import of this. Kapoor's words have the urgency of a military campaign. In this case, the attempt to march upon the art world there is denying the, use of the useless purposefulness I'm not going to so much to the mic, 
to the macro, but a lot more to the micro, because I'm representing this institution and it's based in Bergen. So, uh, uh, 314 Foundation works mainly with international art, and in that sense, it's the global art. They started in uh, 85, and at that time, I mean, it was, it was not, it was not, a, it was quite unique for Norway that uh, that, it, that someone would start something that would be mainly the the, 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 the focus would be mainly on non-Western art. At that time, it was just uh, artist run, so it was just three three artists traveling around and actually trying to facilitate for meetings among colleagues. It was this, and then they uh, arranged exhibitions, both in Norway and they and also bringing uh, Norwegian artists abroad. And it worked that way for a few years, till afterwards they uh, it got more established, so it became a foundation. And in 1999, that comes to like the shift. It's when they get their own, their own space. And with that, it comes the whole institu I mean, the institutionalization part of it. It's different to have events, arrange exhibitions, the other spaces, and and then to have this this focus like one place. And so. Um, and, and it carried on, so like from the, another shift is um, right in the beginning, this, uh, the idea of the international art, and or non-Western uh, art uh, for, the, for the foundation. It was a lot, um, they both shifted among uh, what would be the contemporary art, or contemporary art and also the uh, like world art, more like ethnographic. Projects to this this uh, the institution has grown out of it uh, for uh, several years. It's just uh, it's basically just contemporary art, and um, but now but now that of course there's there's this shift. Uh, I mean the new in internationalism. Of, I mean the idea of contemporary art is per se international, which makes us. Um, which makes the institution have um, an internal discussion all the time. Do, are we really needed? To which point are we needed? An institution to focus on international art, but thinking of a global art, not restricted to Western uh, art. And um, In a sense, then that's when we have to go to really to the micro situation. I mean, in Bergen, um, there are a few artist-run spaces. There are large institutions, and uh, the international is mostly European or Western. Still is, and and it, and it's interesting because. Um, Usually, when uh, one uh, sort of reaffirming that it's going to be uh, not necessarily Western, is the the remark can even <coughs> seem uh, dated because the discourse is so diverse. We refer to the macro structures. We all refer to documenta to bias. But in a local perspective, that's not what's happening. Um, in a local perspective, um, we, we don't really have access to all of this uh, wide international uh, art. So, so again, when we sort of ask ourselves if, if there's a point in being there, then at least in the in relation to where the institution is situated, I do believe there is. And um, even even in regards to uh, CUDA, uh, the Bergen Museum, um, for the last for the last years, basically the international, like the, the real international uh, shows that they've put up the uh, China one and the Sukhdam um, Mural uh, from Turkey. And uh, 
the China the China show the later one even the, the first one where they started the engagement was in a collaboration with the Foundation 314 so even for the local scene when the large institutions come along so sometimes it's even that uh, people were there first and then we sort of you know they got their contacts and of course then they, they, they have to they have <laughs> that, that can say um, <coughs> and, and and again um, is there um, is there um, is there a point in uh, does it does it really when thinking of the international does it really have to be from uh, all over the world and and again uh, that's you know the the, the discussion con continues, and I do, and I do believe that uh, the discursive. Um, I'm not good in talking to many people. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you're doing fine. Um, huh? Yeah, you're, you're doing fine. Um, I mean, uh, the, in the in the in the con I forgot the point. So I'll just uh, show a few pictures and see if we get to that. <laughs> So this uh, this is three fourteen. This is the this is the okay. this is where it is. It used to be a bank. So even though the the location also makes it quite hard. It's not it's not a, it's not a white cube. It's a former bank. Uh, I did get some. Oh, this is from the Transcultural Flux uh, show. Um, this is not inside of 314, but the, the, um, it's by in Shift, where it was uh, exhibited at two, two places. Yeah. Most of the times, because also the, um, the uh, 314 is not so large, so we usually do solo shows. And it's important also, um, uh, when working with it, to try to um, uh, most when the text that we develop, we usually also invite curators or voices from um, from where the the art is established. Because uh, when trying to um, when trying to uh, for me, um, when trying when, when yeah, communicate when communicating about the projects. Um, we we really avoid having just one perspective because, of course, we have to read it with the with it without with our glasses too. But it is, uh, and it's been for years. It's been uh, criticized that it that um, not usually in the theoretic the theory part of it that um, that we really engaged. With uh, with local critics, so this is something that we really avoid. Um, and there are, and as there are many, there are also many solo shows. Um, this is also from the exhibition. It was a, this was the former exhibition that was also done in uh, in collaboration with Trap, Mother Tongue, Turkey. This this one was um, was a like a national uh, uh, exhibition. And now for the yard. This is late. This is earlier on. I brought the pic. I actually brought so many pictures just to see if I was if I was going to get lost, and I did. <laughs> Mainly, um, I didn't go into do all the specifics, but uh, but still, um, main, mainly what we do is that is focusing on uh, international art and thinking of it uh, beyond Western uh, Western uh, uh, art, and sometimes, well not sometimes, but. Um, Thank <laughs> you.
Thank you.